All right, so we are, are going to go over between Europe and China review. There's only 20 terms. We'll go through as quickly as possible. First thing to know, Ottomans in Constantinople. So you remember that uh, Constantinople was used to be like the biggest Orthodox city in the world at Hagia Sophia. It was awesome. It was that Rome had, had been taken over by Vandals and Barbarians in the three and four hundreds. They moved to Constantinople, but bummer for Constantinople, in 1453, they were conquered by the Ottomans. We talked about this. This is the end of the Byzantine Empire. Constantinople gets a new name, Istanbul. And also, you might remember the world's largest church becomes now a mosque. End of an era with Constantinople falling in 1453. And this is just an example of the kind of stuff the Ottomans were able to do, especially under the leadership of this guy, Suleiman the Magnificent. He was really like the leading, the most important conqueror of the Ottoman Empire. He's the one that like really helped the Ottomans push uh, deep into, uh, deep into uh, European territory. Uh, he was the one responsible for them uh, taking over huge portions of Europe and enslaving people. In fact, he made it all the way to the gates of Vienna. You might remember we've talked about that in class. Vienna is uh, really just um, uh, in Austria and almost got that far. So did very well uh, leading this Islamic empire to grow even into Europe. Now there was a country that the Ottomans, uh, a region that the Ottomans would work with and that would be Italy. There's one nation in particular you should know and it's Venice. You might remember that Venice got actually very wealthy from manufacturing and for trade. Uh, you might remember that Venice uh, actually served as a middleman between the Ottoman Empire and the rest of Europe. And it's because of that relationship that they made so much money. They were able to fund the Renaissance. They were able to have artists. And they also, because of their wealth, kind of encouraged countries like Spain and Portugal to sail westward. They were tired of paying these inflated prices and because uh, cities like Venice were part of this trade network making so much money, it inspired not just the Renaissance, but also inspired other countries to find alternative routes to India, whether that meant going around Africa like the Portuguese would or sailing west to America like the Spanish did. Well, as Suleiman the Magnificent expanded the Ottoman Empire, they, as I mentioned moments ago, captured Christian boys, and these Christian boys became slaves. The word for slaves, you should know, are janissaries. And these janissaries, they were taken, uh, there was a tax of, of actual people, and your village or town would have to send so many Christian boys to serve. And these kids were, at first, sent into Turkish homes. They were... Um, raised in Muslim homes, and of course they converted over time. And they were given a brand new weapon, the Janissaries, these slave soldiers were. The weapon they were given is the gun. And so they were given guns and they were trained in this way. Um, Janissaries, as guns became more important, they became more important. In fact, they became essential. Uh, they actually became so popular and important that the traditional cavalry, these guys who would ride horses, they use bows and arrows, they started to really dislike the Janissaries. And there were some internal tensions there. In fact, being a Janissary was such an important job that you actually wanted to make sure your kids would inherit their status as a slave because your life was actually getting really good. They won the right to get married. They actually even won the right to have side businesses. And then these Janissaries became kind of like millionaires. And as a result, you might remember, we even said that at the end, they began to hire substitutes to fight for them in war. And so these Janissaries, these slave soldiers, they went from these you know kids who were being pushed around, who were kind of nobodies, to becoming Muslims over time, and then becoming essential parts of the army. And then, becoming actually so wealthy and rich, they even hired substitutes so they didn't have to show up. So that's Janissaries and their transformation. The Battle of Lepanto, this was a, a battle that the Ottoman Empire fought against Europeans. It was a navy battle. 
and it was a loss for the Ottoman Empire. This is just basically symbolic of a broader problem these Muslim empires have. The Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughal, none of them have really meaningful navies. They, especially early on, they don't really see the importance of sea power. And if you paid attention, the most important countries after 1500 have navies, they have sea power, they're sea base, and that's something that these land-based empires never fully appreciated. And that, again, goes with that next one, too. Land-based empires, these three, the Ottomans, Safavids, Mughal, they never have it. They don't really see the value of it. They don't really pursue sea power, and that's going to be a problem for them. The word devshirmin, we've talked about this before. This is actually the selection process of get, getting these Christian slaves from southeastern Europe. Uh, you would get them from early age, from age as early as like eight years old. You'd put them in a Turkish home. Uh, even though they're raised Christian, they'd give up their Christianity as a result uh, of this process, this slave process, the devshir means how you got Janissaries. We also see that the Ottomans, the Safavids, both of them in, faced financial difficulties because of global inflation. We've identified a culprit someone who's responsible for flooding the market with silver. So much silver that inflation ruined economies. The culprit is Spain, who brought silver from Americas into the global market. This was something that the Ottoman Empire never modernized or adjusted their economy to, and it really hurt the Ottoman Empire. Similarly, the Safavids never adjusted their economy. They never modernized their economy, and so the Safavids were both hurt by Spanish silver that was flooding the global market. Number nine is tax farming. Uh, this was a, a like a, a homework thing, like a, a bowl, a, a starred word you were supposed to fill out on your own. Uh, tax farming is like the worst idea ever. This is where you basically sell the, the right to become a tax collector. And let's say that, for example, I, the government tells me, hey, if you pay me money, you can have this job as tax collector. Okay, well, why would I want to buy a job? Why would I want to pay the government for the right to be a job, uh, to get a job? Well, the reason I'd want that is the government would tell me, you know what, from your town, I need $10,000 a year of taxes. But the cool thing is, if you raise more than 10000 guess what you get to do with the extra? You get to pocket it. So if you're telling me I can buy the permission to become a tax collector, okay, got it. I bought my little tax collector permission slip. Now, you need to, I, I need to raise $10,000 in a year from the village. But if I get more than that, I'm going to pocket it. I'm going to for sure ask for more than $10,000. And I'm going to get really rich. And I'm actually going to probably abuse the people financially because I just see them as, you know, opportunities to get rich. Tax farming terrible idea. It hurts people's lives. It hurts the economy. It bankrupts people. This is, though, the strategy the Ottoman Empire used, and it's a terrible idea. Number 10, speaking of terrible ideas, the tulip period. So you might remember that there's a time that the Ottoman elites, Ottoman rich people, really got into copying European culture. And one of the biggest examples of copying European culture was this fad of collecting tulips. And it was such a ridiculous fad that the price of tulips were astronomical. I think we gave the example that one tulip bulb was the same value of like 22 oxen. So this is an example of the elites looking to Europe, wanting to copy European culture and fashion. And there's a group of, mu of mu Muslims in the Ottoman Empire that didn't want anything to do with this. In fact, they were very conservative, very traditional Muslims, and they rose up against this. It was called the Patrona Halil Rebellion. And so you have Muslims who are thinking, look, uh, we should be copy. We should not be copying Europe. We should not copy, you know, white European fashion. We need to copy the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. And so it causes divides and tensions in the Ottoman Empire itself between those who want to follow Europe and others who want to say, get back to the Quran. We also know, number 11, that the Ottoman Empire had a rival, their greatest rival, their enemy, was not a Christian European nation, but their greatest rival was a fellow Muslim nation of the Safavids. 
the one of the biggest reasons, but not the only reason, that they're rivals is there's a difference of religion. This is a problem that's been around from the very beginning in the Muslim world. It's always stayed the same. It's the issue of Sunnis and the issue of Shias. The Ottomans are the Sunnis. The Safavids are the Shias. That is the, the rival. And then speaking of the Safavid Empire and their religion, they have a man named Ismail who makes Sufi uh, uh, Shia Islam the official religion of the Safavid Empire. He makes Shia Islam the official religion of the Safavid Empire. And briefly, you might remember that the Shia religion is all based about the family of Ali, that when Muhammad died, there was a debate who should take over. The Sunnis said, let's just vote for the guy we respect the most. And they voted for Abu Bakr. Uh, the Shia said, no, it's got to be a family member of Muhammad. And Muhammad had a cousin and a son-in-law named Ali. They vote for Ali. Sadly, Ali dies. He has a son, Hussein dies. And you might remember that they celebrate, they honor, they mourn Hussein's death by whipping or cutting themselves once a year on the anniversary of his death. But they also believe that Ali and Hussein are important because they receive from Muhammad secret information about Islam. And they pass it on father to son, father to son. And it went all the way to a 12th imam. A imam is like a Shia religious leader, almost like a pope-like figure. But that father-son, father-son relationship stopped at the 12th imam, who disappeared and is taken up to heaven. He's referred to as the hidden imam. But they believe that this hidden imam is going to come back at the end of the world. And it's going to, you know, everything's going to be put into place when the 12th imam returns. 14 about the Safavid Empire, we mentioned that, uh, you know, women are definitely covered and protected, not just women, but men as well. We've looked at pictures, men and women dress conservatively. They cover their legs, their arms, their hair. But we also said that there are same sex relationships that were practiced in the Safavid Empire, that the same sex relationships were not uncommon. They were not hidden. We talked about the dancing boys. We saw pictures of this and poetry in the Safavid Empire talked as much about romantic love between a man and a woman as a man and a beardless boy who they thought that's okay. We also mentioned as we move to uh, the decline of the Safavids that there was various things that led to the decline of the Safavid Empire. We saw, for example, the problem of inflation because of silver coming in from the Americas. We saw that they didn't have a whole lot of trade. I mean, the average person was a uh, um, subsistence farmer, you know. They had at one time the Silk Road going through their country, and now the average person is just basically farming to survive. We also know the Safavids, like all these land-based countries, never had a navy, which is problematic. So these are all some of the things uh, that caused the Safavid Empire to decline. Inflation, mismanaging the Silk Road so that now everyone just basically is doing, uh, you know, uh, farming just to survive and not having a navy. We also, on your handout, talked about the Mughal Empire. This is a different empire because it is a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority in India. And even though they are ruled by Muslims, the average religion in the Mughal Empire is actually Hinduism. Now, this caused a lot of tension because Muslims destroyed Hindu temples and Hindu art. And realizing that this tension could tear India apart, a man named Akbar said, you know what, we need to ease these tensions. And Akbar decides to marry a Hindu woman to try to show we can reconcile these two religions. Akbar ends the freedom of religion tax to kind of show Hindus that we can all come together, though Akbar is a Muslim. But then Akbar goes even further, and some people say kind of crazy, by inventing his own religion where he practiced syncretism, right? He took a little bit of Hinduism and Islam and Christianity and Zoroastrianism to make his own religion where he was God. 
Well, after the tolerance of Akbar, kind of mixing all these religions together at the end, you have Aurangzeb. And this leader, number 18, he gets back to Islam as being the official religion. He helps to order temple, uh, uh, Hindu temples be destroyed again. He kills Sikhs, uh, S-I-K-H. The Sikhs are the um, new religion that we see in this time period. The Sikhs really um, from the Punjab province of northwest India. And, and the Sikhs often uh, are said to mix elements of Hinduism and Islam. They believe in reincarnation, but they reject the caste system, and they're victims of this period of intolerance. And because of this intolerance that we see against Hindus, against Sikhs, India really begins to fall apart. Uh, They become to fragment regionally, and that provides the perfect opportunity for the Europeans to come in and take advantage of that. 1920, the last land-based empire is Russia. Compared to Europe, well, frankly, Russia is backward. Uh, They are not as advanced. In fact, you might remember they still have serfs, like 500 years after the rest of Europe got rid of serfs. Their economy is not great. Only 2% of the population owns any land. Uh, It's pretty bad. And worst of all, they don't have a warm water port. All the major European countries have navies. Russia can't have a navy. And this is going to put Russia in a very bad situation. The man who's going to try to change all this is Peter the Great. And his desire is to modernize Russia. He does that in various ways. He realizes if all the cool countries have a navy, I need a navy. And so what Peter the Great does is he launches a war with the Ottomans to take the Black Sea. It fails. He launches a war with Sweden to take the Baltic Sea. See, it succeeds. And then you might remember he actually even moved the capital to St. Petersburg, where he is finally on the coast, finally can have a navy, finally have this window to the west to modernize. He builds a new capital. He copies French architecture of Versailles and even orders his men to shave their beards as he realizes We need to modernize. The Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughal don't modernize in time, so their empires will fall apart. Russia understands the need and will do their best under Peter the Great to do what he can to look like, act like, and build and fight like Western Europe, giving Russia an important role in the years to come. With that, we've gone through. Good luck. Thank you all so much.